Starting up. And we're live. All right, hi everybody. We have a slightly more conventional uh, lecture, the set of lectures this week because these lectures don't exist yet. Uh, they're about to exist. So, uh, and the notes actually didn't exist yesterday, but kind of exist today. So, um, so I, I'm working hard to try to get those out. Uh, I think they're they're actually for today's lecture in fairly good shape. So, um, <clears throat> I want to talk today about model-based policy search. So, I'll explain exactly what I mean by that. There's kind of a theoretical side to it, uh, and then some there's some nice results that have come up even in the, just the last few years, and it's a an active place for sort of theory and control and reinforcement learning. Uh, and then there's some just practical things that uh, some an algorithm that you might try, um, and I'll try to show you I'll give you a little taste of both today. So the the plan here is to do sort of the basic formulation, make sure we understand the motivation. Why would you want to search in the space of policies instead of um, alternatives like we've talked about, okay? Um, the special case that I, that I wanna dig into since we know and love it is, is the linear quadratic regulator. What would it look to design a linear quadratic regulator uh, in this different algorithmic style where you're trying to do gradient descent directly on the parameters K of the, of the feedback controller? And the punchline, and to give it away here, is that that problem is actually non-convex, but it turns out to be okay, and we can do gradient descent. There's there's um, yeah, a theoretical justification for it having no local minima, which is one of these great examples. But there are also counterexamples that are pretty simple problems where we don't expect gradient descent to do well, and I'll just sort of I'll go through one or two of those, uh, and then finally I'll give you sort of an algorithmic. Uh, uh, tool of, of trying to use some of the same machinery we used for trajectory optimization, but to do it to instead of optimize the trajectory, optimize the parameters of the controller. Okay, so um, like I said, the notes are starting to wink into existence. Um, I think they're in pretty good shape. They're, I'm sorry that I hadn't linked them on the calendar yet because they didn't exist, uh, but, but I'll link them tonight because I think they're they're hopefully useful for this uh, for this part of the lecture. Okay, so um, I, I want to spend most of the time actually. I want to start off sort of on the whiteboard here. Oops, not that one. This one. Okay, what the heck do I mean when I'm talking about policy search, right? Let's take the case of uh, an LQR just as, a, as an, even an example, right? So we've done a couple things. We've um, we said if you have an LQR problem and a cost function, you'd like to minimize the long-term cost. Then we know the cost to go function is a quadratic form and the controller is, a, is also a linear feedback controller. Those are the optimal controllers. I can even say J star, U star, let's say, okay? <clears throat> and as a result of that knowledge, our best tools so far, we've always started by solving for, you know, step one is sort of solve for S, right? And then Step two, once we have S, back out K, right? The K is that goes downhill as fast as possible given the cost to go function. And actually, if you think about it, in most of the tools we've used so far, this, um, that, so we, trajectory optimization is the counter example where we looked at the control actions directly on the, uh, on the trajectory, but anything that was a feedback controller we really focused on coming up with the cost to go function or the Lyapunov function, or, you know, something was, we're trying to find some nugget of a, um, you know, like an energy like function that describes the feedback controller implicitly, because then once we have that, we can just go downhill. 
And there's a lot of things to like about that. There's a, um, you know, it's sort of, it feels like exactly the right thing to learn about a controller. Uh, it sort of tells you exactly what you need to know about the future, nothing you don't need to know. It's like a scalar function that tells you everything. It's a great thing and the dynamic programming is a great thing. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about today is what if we don't solve for S? We just, we instead search for K directly. Okay, and more generally, if I have a controller, that's going to be a problem. Oh well. Um, okay, so so if I have some control law pi with some parameter vector alpha, right? What I'd like to do is somehow search over the class of parameters alpha that um, optimize some my control objective directly. When u equals negative kx, then alpha is just the enumerated k, you know, the vectorized version of k. Okay, so why would you ever want to do that? I just, we don't, we've seen all these beautiful things about cost to go functions and the Apinov functions. Um, <clears throat> I think in a lot of places you don't actually want to do it, but there is one really good argument. Um, my, I'm lecturing right now. Let's do it later. Okay. Wait. Okay. So um, the the really good example I think is that uh, there are some problems that are very hard dynamics, potentially very hard cost to go functions to represent. They might re require require high degree polynomials or super high dimensional or super complex uh, cost to go functions. And it might be that you could have a very simple controller that that, uh, that sort of works for the system, right? So my favorite example of that would be like um, the, the contact problem of just you know trying to pick up a coffee mug, for instance, right? So uh, if that if I think about the dynamics of the problem, the contact mechanics are sort of the way we write them down is depends on every surface of my let's say rigid body approximation of my hand connecting with the mug. The order matters. The number of faces that are in contact matters. The dynamics are actually very, very hard to, to write down. Similarly, the cost to go function, at least an accurate one, is going to have lots and lots of nuances for the, given the contact state and the um, whatever. But it turns out, you know, if I just go up and squeeze, if I have a controller that roughly says squeeze, right, that's going to work pretty well in a lot of situations. And that's not just, I mean, that, that task is sort of too simple. But but we see that over and over again in, in more complicated systems. Um, we saw that uh, we'll, we'll later in the class, we'll talk about flapping flight. It turns out there's some pretty simple controllers for flapping flight, but the dynamics are Lob Navier Stokes, right? So, um, so you kind of, it's, there are some times where it just makes sense to write down a very simple controller and see what it's capable of doing. Okay, so, um, so that's the setup. Well, that's the motivation, I guess. Uh, the actual setup is close to what we've seen before. We need just one embellishment, right? So typically we've written down um, that for some initial conditions, I'll call J my, my infinite horizon cost. Right? The more general form is like this, subject to X zero equals zero. I'll bring over the notation here that I'll just stick my alpha right here on, the, on J and I'll say, um, this is the case when uh, U is executing that controller parameterized by alpha. And of course, uh, X dot equals F of X U, right? <clears throat> so this is the cost to go from a single um, initial condition, right? It's, it's already zoomed in. Oops, I just wrote zero when I meant to write X here. Right, so um, this is sort of honed in on what's the cost you'll incur if you get a single initial condition. And then we, we did that in a couple of cases. In the trajectory optimization case, that was explicitly what we were doing. We were only worried about a single initial condition. In the value iteration case, which was sort of the opposite extreme, we were doing it for all initial conditions simultaneously. But because we had this beautiful Bellman recursion, you, you never really had to pick which 
states were more important than the other states, okay? But for the first time here, if I want a scalar quantity that I'm gonna to try to optimize that summarizes my total performance, then I need to somehow say how relevant each state is, okay? So I need some sort of metric over the state space. And the natural one, although we're not gonna to think too much about stochastic dynamics until uh, later in the class, the natural way to think about that is to, you put some score over your, um, over your states saying which ones are important, which ones aren't important. And sort of the natural score would be to write a distribution of a probability distribution over what are my initial conditions, right? So, and then you'd like to somehow maximize the expected value of your performance, okay? So the way we'll write that is we're gonna to try to write a min over alpha, the expected value of J alpha X, where X now is drawn from some initial condition distribution. Right, so if I am trying to optimize the swing up controller for an, uh, an acrobat and all my initial conditions are right near the top, right, then that's going to give me a very different controller than if I say um, my initial conditions are all right near the bottom. I've got some probability distribution. And you can choose to make it uniform over the entire space, if you will, and that'll give you a different controller still. But some, somehow the expected value of this, um, of this function, you know, it's a scalar function, the expected value of the function is just going to be a single number which tells me how happy am I with the controller in general over many states? Okay, so um, the problem with that is, I mean, th th that's actually the sort of the best case. And we'll see when we do do stochastic optimal control that the expected value plays beautifully with the, the recursive form of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. It's, it's sort of the natural pick is to say, I want the average um, performance, okay? But still, for general nonlinear systems, computing this expected value is super hard. Like it, yeah, the distributions uh, can get very complicated. So um, let's at least study, before we go too far, let's study like the linear case, the one case where we can knock it all out. And it's, I think, um, I, I think it's sort of like the pinnacle of, of what we could ever hope to achieve in terms of a gradient based algorithm, right? If we can, if we could make any other algorithm look even a little bit like this, then we'd be super happy. But it, I think it really, it's good for, um, good for the soul. I think I said that the other day, right? So, um, okay, so let's, let's work out the LQR case. Okay, so um, what is the expected value of given some initial conditions of this integral? Okay, um, let's choose, this is of course subject to x, x dot equals ax plus bu in the LQR case. And let's choose x zero so that um, basically x of zero is drawn from some the normal distribution with zero mean and just some covariance. I'll, I'll write it as a omega. Okay, so I'm gonna have a Gaussian around my origin as the initial conditions. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna do stochastic control yet. This is, a, there's no other randomness in the system. It's still a completely deterministic system here, but um, we'll just say, we don't know exactly what the initial conditions are gonna be. We'd like to optimize it over a function of, uh, you know, over some Gaussian around the initial conditions. Okay, this is, um, a special case of something called H2 optimal control, if you've seen it. Uh, because you can, you can make an input of the system, which is just your disturbance and an output, which is your cost and talk about the, the H2 um, uh, uh, norm of the linear system. But, but if you don't know that, it doesn't, it doesn't add anything here. It's just to connect the dots if you've heard H2 optimal control. Uh, okay, so so then how do we go about computing that um, that form? Now, you might know that one of the magical things about linear systems and Gaussians is that they, they play beautifully together. If you start with an initial condition of Gaussians, 
and you push it through a linear dynamical system, then your distribution stays Gaussian the entire time. That's kind of a magical thing. Um, so it turns out if we think the re we can, you know, the magic again is that we, is always that we can integrate a linear dynamical system in closed form, even though we can't do that in general, right? So let's just think about the implications here. I have uh, X of T is gonna be in this case, since I have also U equals negative KX, my closed form solution of the linear dynamical system looks like that, okay? So you've seen in differential equations classes, E to the AT kind of stuff. And we've seen the matrix form of that, although with, you know, we've only in passing, we've, it's come up a few times. This is just the matrix form of it with the, um, you know, A minus BK is the closed loop dynamics, right? You can write the closed loop dynamics as just A minus BKX. Okay, so that's the, that is the solution to the differential equation. Um, it turns out then that if you want to write the covariance of the differential equation, and actually what we, what we end up wanting to write is the expected value of the integral of the covariance. That looks like a scary thing to have to compute. And it turns out to have beautiful, simple solutions. Over and over again in linear control, you see these quadratic forms appear and, uh, and they have nice solutions almost always in the form of a Lyapunov function. But let me just sort of pull you through the steps here. Okay, we have good solutions to this. Turns out, if you if you care, it's the solution to the. Um, if I call this capital X, then this is the solution to the Lyapunov equation which is uh, what is it going to be? A minus B K X plus X transpose A minus B K plus omega, which is my initial conditions, equals zero. So that's one of these, the Lyapunov equations, just like we saw for when we were finding um, quad, the Lyapunov function itself, same form of the equation. And we know how to solve, we have good solvers for this. So we can find our x, which is the integral of that. The proof that that Lyapunov equation is, computes this, um, this sum is, uh, it's not hard, but it's, probably not worth me going into. You can, I linked to like a Wikipedia, it comes up in the controllability Gramian and observability Gramian. It's the same sort of the Apanova function. But the point is, um, you know, for the last time, we will be able to integrate not only the, um, the dynamics forward in time, but even the covariance forward in time. We're gonna be able to push our distribution forward in time. And then we can do a little magic with the cost function. So um, I have this X transpose QX plus U transpose RU. That is a scalar function, right? There's a bunch of vectors flying around, but the whole thing computes a scalar cost, right? So I can change it by, I, I, don't, I don't change it by taking the trace, right? The trace of a scalar is just the number back. But the trace has these nice properties where I can start rearranging things. I can take the trace of the first term plus the trace of the second term and, um, and rewrite this as Q of X, X transpose. R of U, U transpose, well, let's even, Let's do it the other way. Let me substitute in X right away. So I'm gonna get trace of X transpose Q 
plus, because I get two minuses here, um, k transpose r k x. And because of this cyclic property of trace, this is something that um, you'll just see it's a trick that comes up a lot. You can, I can twist my matrix multiplies around in the trace operator. I get a Q plus K transpose Q. X, X transpose. You can see this is starting to look a bit like that. Turns out if you want to take the integral of that whole thing, then you can pull the integral inside the trace. Everything's in the notes, but what you end up the integral of X transpose QX plus U transpose RU comes out to be the trace of um, Q plus K transpose RK and the expected value of the integral of X, X transpose DT. Which is just the trace of that thing x that I know how to compute. Where did the expected value come from? Um, it was written above, and I forgot to write it here. Thank you. Good call. So I don't really want, I mean, I, I want you to care about the algebra sometime, but right now um, the point here is that I've taken a fairly complicated thing, which is the distribution of initial conditions pushed through a system of a linear system in closed feedback loop. And I've tried to ask what is the performance objective integrated over time, given those initial conditions. And the answer is of course gonna be a scalar and it's a scalar that I can just compute. I don't have to sample, I don't have to do anything. I can just compute exactly. You give me a K, the exact cost to go, or cost you expect in the expected value here is this is given by this, this number, okay? Because, of, because we have that a beautiful closed form expression, we can understand the LQR case better than we'll understand uh, the general case. Okay, so the question now becomes, how does this change with respect to K? Right, so, so in particular, if, I, if you give me a K and I wanna fiddle with that K and understand how this term changes, what are my prospects, right? That's the question, the next question. And there's a couple things we know. I would love to just tell you it's convex in K. It looks kind of convex in K, right? Because there's a quadratic in K here. But remember, um, X, maybe I could even write X depending on K here. If I, I don't want to get the notation too confusing there, but X has a dependence on K, which if I was using LaTeX, I would write nicely, but, but on my, yeah, maybe I can use multicolor here. X depends on K. It's the solution to this Riccati equation, this, this Lyapunov equation, which depended on K. And it depends in a bad, sort of a non-convex way on K, okay? Not to mention it's gonna be multiplied by then quadratic form of K. So we know actually that this objective is not convex in K. Even more so, the classic sort of um, the classic sort of result is that the uh, it doesn't matter. It wasn't like you chose a bad objective. It's not like the LQR objective was suddenly uh, made it hard. It's actually that if you just think about linear dynamical systems closed in a feedback loop with a controller K, then that set the set of controllers. Some of those Ks will make the system go unstable. Some of them will make it go stable to the origin, right? Um, if you just look at the values of K that make it go stable to the origin, even that set is not convex. You can pick controller one, go stably to the origin, 
order uh, to the origin. Controller two goes stably to the or origin. Take the average, take the line between them in parameter space, pick something like in the middle, and you can find a controller that will the system will blow up, right? So if you're in general trying to, to just tune K, uh, it, it, there's, we have not yet given you any reason to be confident. It could be that you could twist K and the system that was going nicely downhill could just blow up. It's known that the con it's not convex in that. And I gave us a, a simple example. Um, I, I spent like a long time trying to find sort of a nice plot that I could make that showed you the, the landscape. And then I realized that the theorem is actually that you need to be in at least three dimensions to, to have it be non-convex. So, um, so I like was fighting uh, theory. I wasn't gonna find a, a, a pretty plot, but I gave you simple numbers, I think. And you can, you can check them if you like. Okay, so the set of stabilizing controllers, right? Stabilizing, not optimal, just stabilizing. Nothing to do with the objective is non-convex in K. Okay, and it's sort of, I mean, the it, it therefore follows that that the set of the optimal control costs, since it will be infinite for the unstable ones that we've written here, uh, and finite for the for the stable ones, the cost function we've written, is also going to be non-convex in K. There was a great discussion on Piazza, right? People asked, um, someone asked about convex Lyapunov functions, right? And we had a, a, a back and forth saying, actually, you can have a Lyapunov function that proves stability, even if it's not convex, right? A Lyapunov function doesn't actually have to be convex to prove stability. Right? You just have to be able to go downhill and get to the origin. Convex functions are the easiest way to show that that's true, but um, it doesn't actually have to be, to, to be strictly convex. And there's a class of functions uh, that there's, there are various classes of functions, quasi-convex and other, other things that, are, uh, that have this property that they don't have local minima, they will get you to the, if, you grade, if you're using gradient descent on them, you will find the, the global minima um, but they are not convex functions. And again, there's another one um, that I sort of worked out uh, in the notes. Here's, here's one, of the, um, one of the famous ones. If I do x squared plus three sine squared x, this is a function that um, looks like x squared. It's kind of, it's kind of like x squared, but it's got this extra sine squared term, so it's kind of wiggling. Draw that a little more carefully. If that's my x squared, then it kind of it starts going like this, and then it goes like this, and kind of chases the x squared thing with this extra sine term on top of it in both ways. Okay, so um, with this three nicely chosen, right? Then it it happens that the sine term, this is like this is the place maybe you'd worry about, right? Where it's not convex in the sense that I can pick this point, I can pick this point, the line between them is below the actual curve, right? So it's a not a convex function. But if I start gradient descent here, it'll roll right through that and go to the origin, right? And you can show um, the conditions that you need sort of to, to verify that that thing is actually not going to have local minima. Okay, the conditions that you need are, first of all, that this thing is smooth. Uh, in order to, to use the second condition I need, I, I am assuming first that the function is smooth. There are ways to prove things for non-smooth functions also. Okay. And then the second function, the, the, the second property you need, it's, it's very commonly just called the PL inequality. It's the Polyak 
Lajewski, Lajewski um, hard to write, hard to read. Um, my Unicode didn't work. Actually, I'm seeing in the notes that it's that's supposed to be an L with a line through it, and I got a, something else. But um, PL inequality, and you're going to see it more and more in sort of um, it's, it's it comes up in a lot of analysis in sort of theoretical RL and the like. Right now, it's uh, a way to talk about gradient dominance. which basically says you want your gradient to go to increase faster than some quadratic function. Okay, I'll, I'll write it down carefully just, but I, I want you to more have the intuition that get bogged down in the details here. So if I can say for all X that the magnitude of my gradient is somehow greater than some scalar F star, that it goes up faster than the, the distance from my optimal, um, my optimal value goes up. Okay, then, then I have this gradient dominance property. And this is one way, one of the many ways to show that you have, um, that you have no local minima. And in particular, uh, there's some, some nice papers that, that relate gradient descent. You know, they give, they give you a gradient descent with a step size based on the this mu and a step size based on the Lipschitz constant, and they will give you a rate at which it converges um, and show the gradient descent converges. What is F star? So just, F, I'm sorry, F star is the minimum, minimizing value. Ah. Good, good call. In this case, it's zero. Argmin f of x. Let me take a breath there. People, people have questions about this. This is a general statement about functions um, and having lo no local minima. Okay, we could have used it in the, in the case of Lyapunov, like the question that came up on uh, Piazza. We could have used that as a tool there. It happens to be uh, coming up here partly because it's uh, it's been used in some of the the recent results about uh, convergence of, of of these kind of gradient based search algorithms. Um, but but it's just as useful in terms of Lyapunov. I had sort of fun. Um, I was. It, it turned out to be that proving um, proving that this had a Lipschitz constant was easy. Like uh, the it was easy to bound the the sign term and and whatever and find find L. Okay. Um, this one to actually find a mu and convince make a convincing argument that um, that I had found a mu. Uh, well, I couldn't. I didn't see it quickly in the uh, in messing with the equations and trying to think what I could bound the trigonometrics and the like. Um, so I thought, oh, maybe I can write a sums of squares program, right? That would be good, right? I could say uh, find the lar largest mu such that um, such that this is this inequality holds. Unfortunately, this. Um, I mean, it's, it could have been true that I could have found a sums of squares program that worked. Uh, given sort of using sine and, and x as independent variables, but it didn't, uh, I wasn't able to, I think. Uh, so the, the fact that x appears um, both by itself and inside the trigonometric, um, uh, that is something that I can't express in sums of squares. So I ended up pulling out a different uh, verification tool, DReal, which is a, um, another verification tool. Oh, uh, another question. If we're writing yeah. primary x squared plus three sine squared x as a sums of squares, is sine of x a valid monomial? Um, so, so good. So that's exactly what I did. So you can write um, sine of x as a monomial, x as a monomial, cosine of x as a monomial, 
sine squared. You don't write, need to write cosine squared if you include one, because uh, one, you know, I, could, I, I wrote those as my list of monomials and it was unable to certify the positivity because in that basis of monomials, it had no way to realize that the relationship between the X monomial and the sine monomial, right? So I, I would be asking for those to be, to be true despite any coupling, but actually the coupling between those variables helps here, so. Good question. But there's a there's a there's a, a nice set of tools that people use um, for for verification. DREAL is another favorite, and um, and so I gave you a DREAL certificate that mu equals 0.175, uh, at least on the reasonable doubles up to some reasonable number, and I could easily bound the the infinite case. Okay. Cool. So so. Uh, that's the, the intuition of a, of a function not having no local minima. And the result, which I will just point you to the paper for, is that it turns out if you're searching, if you, if you, this cost function that we wrote, this complicated cost function with the trace of, uh, you know, Q plus K transpose R, you know, this you can actually show for any sub-level set of the, um, of this cost that it, it satisfies the PL inequality and therefore has no local minima. So that's pretty cool. So basically it says in LQR, we know how to search for S. You don't have to, you could just write down K, do gradient descent, pick your initial K. It'll only go, it'll, it'll go downhill. Gradient descent will go downhill if you choose um, your step size appropriately, carefully, potentially. In particular, K won't go and blow up on you and make your system um, go unstable, right? And it'll eventually get the global optimal solution. When I remember when the result came out, there were, you know, um, there were people in the room like, that's awesome. I didn't know that. I was, I was surprised. And then there were a bunch of um, people who'd been thinking about controls for a long time. They're like, yeah, yeah we need that. <laughs> uh, because I guess, it, you know, there's, there's a, uh, there's just this intuition people have about linear dynamical systems and the existence of convex reformer uh, reparameterizations that sort of imply that this must have been true. Um, but it, it's super good. And it's super good for the RL case because um, what it suggests is if you didn't, even if you didn't have A and, uh, a and B, you didn't have your model, uh, there's a chance and people have done additional work to show that the model free version of this enjoys some of the same properties that you could just try and do sort of reinforcement learning directly on the parameters K and, and have that work, right? Where um, that's, that's easier than potentially learning a cost to go function or a Q function and trying to find your controller backwards from that. Okay. You can actually, even for the, um, for the LQR case, one of the things that made that result go is that you can actually even take the gradient directly um, in close in a, well, not closed form and by solving the solution of a Lyapunov equation. But this is just, I think a really beautiful case of what it would look like to do gradient descent directly in the policy parameters K. And we can say strong things about its convergence and it's a, it's a perfectly good algorithm. Uh, I would love to say that this result is true in general and that you should be able to do policy, search in the policy parameters uh, and it'll just work, right? That, this, that everything's as good as LQR, but we, there are similarly simple examples that just don't work. Um, and we know that they, they don't work. Uh, I mean, I cited one that shows even with a, if you do a fully discrete um, value iteration problem with just two nodes in a graph and your only decision variable is the probability of transitioning between these nodes, even that kind of problem can have uh, local minima in the, uh, <clears throat> in the policy parameters, okay? Uh, the one that I think is more relevant for the class here and, and more relevant for my work, let's say, is that if you do output feedback, okay? In particular, static output feedback. 
then this is a case that, um, that looks very similar to LQR and it just doesn't work and it's not gonna work. Okay, so um, let's just change the problem a little bit. So I got x dot equals ax plus bu. Now I have y equals c of x. So I have sensors y, okay? Otherwise it's the same thing. But now I'm not allowed to go directly from state to action, but I go from sensors to action. Okay, this is, this is called the static out, linear static output feedback problem. Okay, this time searching the, the set of stabilizing controllers. Stabilizing again, not even for this uh, cost function is in general, can be, I should say can be, so there, are, there are certainly instances a disconnected set. Okay, so you can find um, simple problems, I gave one in the notes where, where there's a set of Ks over here that is stabilizing, there's a set of Ks over here that is stabilizing, but you cannot get from this case to these case without going unstable. That's bad news. That means it doesn't matter what your, your cost landscape is. If your minimum is in this side and your initial guess is in this side, you can't just do gradient descent to get there without going unstable on the way there. Okay. There's, there's are, there are more interesting cases of output feedback. I mean, so is it clear what I mean by output feedback? Some people might call this like pixels to torques. Right, sense a direct mapping from sensors to actions, right? You might do it with a neural network. This is just doing it with a linear map and it's already bad. I'm sorry that I just noticed the chat was there. The chat's like half an hour old. I'm sorry about that. But. I'll answer those questions at the end since they're a little stale. I apologize, I didn't see anything. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so is that clear? It's that that uh, there are many problems for which the, the gradient descent is just not gonna work. Now, here's the part where I'm honestly torn. What I don't know is, um, so, so I, th I think the, con the control theory community, I think has largely not focused on policy search type algorithms, right? There are some hardness results like this one, which says searching for K for a static output feedback is NP hard, right? And people sort of know it's bad in the general case. And so it's kind of doesn't make sense to search in K. And then the RL folks came along and started searching directly in K and, and used deep neural networks. And they started you know, having great empirical success. And now, so everybody's a little torn, I, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm a little torn, right? So the, the big question is, there's, is there something happening today that is different? Like maybe over parameterization in a deep neural network makes this okay again. We're trying, we're trying to understand that. That's one of the big important questions, okay? Or maybe the worst case analysis that we've kind of done in controls uh, is just too bad for the real world. And like the real world doesn't, it doesn't give you problems like if I have to say, if I say this result must hold for all possible A and B matrices, right? There are some A and B matrices out there that are just really bad. They've got like, you know, open loop poles and zeros that are kind of interleaved. There's just really bad numerical things hiding in all A and B. And it might be that like, you know, mechanics just doesn't give us that, right? That, that the problems that we actually have to solve in the real world are of somehow an easier class. And so that is, a, I think, one of the big, big questions is, can we say something that's not a worst case analysis? Can we talk about distributions of problems where gradient descent works well or parameters, families of parameterizations where, um, where, where gradient descent would work well? But I do think, um, you know, although people say it's working, these, these kind of search algorithms are working in practice, um, 
and they say, well, of course, it's because of deep network parameterizations and over parameterization. I think there's a gap in practice. The, the networks that people optimize with these methods are still fairly small. I don't think they're in the over parameterization regime often. And I think they don't work all the time, right? I think there's a lot of trial and error testing and, and, and hacking. So the result has to probably be something else like, um, you know, they kind of work most of the time if you try enough. And, and so what is that, you know, something like that, it seems to be the regime we're in. And it's super good because it is working a lot if you try hard enough, but we need somehow, I think the math to catch up. Okay. Um, so what does the more general case look like, right? So if I want to min over alpha E of X drawn from X zero of my uh, long-term cost, right? I'll just write it as J alpha X. Well, I can write it out too. Expected value integral zero to infinity of Uh, the first thing that totally broke down for us is this, the ability to take the expected value of this long-term cost. Because um, in general, it's like only in the linear case am I gonna be able to compute that, um, that expected value perfectly, right? So what, it, what we end up doing instead is some sort of approximation here of that expected value. And one of the natural ones that people do is, um, is to take a sample-based approximation. Call it a Monte Carlo algorithm. Monte Carlo approximation. Okay, so we'll say that the expected value of J X of alpha is approximately equal to Oops. Right, I'm gonna basically evaluate the deterministic cost to go from a lot of different initial conditions and then average them, right? And if I draw those initial conditions from this distribution, then the average one, the average will actually be an empirical estimation of the, of the true expected value. Right, so what does that look like? That means basically I'm gonna start the robot in the lot of initial conditions, run it forward, you know, evaluate the cost along that, and then, uh, and then make that approximation of, my, of the total cost. And I'll somehow use the gradients of that in order to, um, to improve my policy. It turns out, again, the expected value is beautiful in the sense that if I wanna take the gradient of this, And the gradient will slip right inside the sum or the expected value, right? So it's the equivalent of the gradient of any one rollout summed up. But this term, I hope your recognition system is, is lighting up here. This is exactly the thing that we computed when we did trajectory optimization. It's a, I guess it's a little bit more general in the sense that alpha here is parameterizing the po is the parameters of the policy instead of the parameters of the trajectory, but the chain rule doesn't doesn't care. The the, the math that we did for the for the chain rule and the um, adjoint methods and or a forward pass um, for trajectory optimization is exactly the math you need to compute this gradient once again. Okay. The um, trajectory optimization.
for um, works for sort of for, for finite horizon problems. But we can, there's a natural extension to make it infinite horizon. But for, for, if we think about it for finite horizon costs, you know, I, I want to um, minimize the expected cost for the next 10 seconds with a feedback controller. Then this, those gradients, taking the gradients of the, of the policy parameters are exactly what you need. And you sum them up. Okay, so this is a class of algorithms that now we're, um, we're kind of on the boundary of what of the pure model based control and the and the reinforcement learning based control. In reinforcement learning, we would tend to not be able to try to compute uh, this this term exactly with the gradients of the plant and the gradients of my cost function and the like. You would we, we would use less of those gradients. We would assume that we don't have access to the model in the model free uh, reinforcement learning, but the model based algorithms take those gradients just like you would in trajectory optimization. Okay, so that gives us a class of algorithms. Let me actually try to switch um, screens here. This is all pushed to the notes, and um, it's a it's a bit of a um, it's not as tidy as some of the code I try to provide, but it'll be more tidy in a few days. But uh, uh, I went through and I made a controller that um, declares a few parameters. Is that big enough? Let me make it a little bigger, I think. So the systems we framework that we have in Drake allows you to declare parameters. Okay, I just made my parameterized controller that declared some parameters. Okay, my actual the implementation, the output, the output port is just calling this function command output. Okay, um, I just evaluate a basis functions. This is the pendulum swing up. I forgot to say. I'm sorry. I'm going to do this, the pendulum swing up, um, but with the, the policy gradient way, okay? And I'm going to just, I'm going to do something closer to what we did for um, sums of squares where I'll choose a, a, a basis, a reasonable basis. I'll, just, I'll say the basis is one plus sine, cos, uh, the theta dot, just a, some reasonable small basis. You could put a neural network in here too. And I think um, these days you should probably, but it's clear, I, I wanted to ask first, can I just, uh, try a very simple function that I could potentially then verify after the fact. Okay. Um, the cost function, I chose just to sort of lean on the systems framework a little bit. I chose to make a different system in my block diagram. So I have the, the plant system, the controller system, they're connected in feedback. And then I have a new another system, which is my running cost, which just implements X transpose um, Qx plus r u squared, um, where the cost is taken around the upright. Okay. And then, sorry to scroll a little bit here, but when I put it all together, I'm also, I'm going to add an integrator in there uh, to integrate the, the dynamics of the, the running cost into a total cost. Okay, so I just wired this thing up in a block diagram form in order to have exactly uh, the, the cost that I care about computed in the output system. Okay, um, how can I help you be less confused? Okay, I saw it coming this time. Oh, um... If you, so you have this, uh, the gradient is res with respect to X. Mm -hmm. oh, it's respect, no, the gradient is respect to alpha. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna sample initial conditions X, simulate the trajectory with the, under that controller. So with that fixed alpha, 
which was K in the LQR case. And then I'm going to ask the question, if I had changed, you know, if I had made an incremental change to the parameters alpha, how would my cost have changed? Okay. So in this place, alpha is playing the role that like the spline parameters of the trajectory optimization used to play. But now instead of parameterizing the um, command with a spline over time, it's a function of state. Okay, all good. Cool. Um, I didn't need to for this such a simple problem. I could have just used gradient descent, but I thought I should uh, go ahead and, and show, give an example of how you would use the auto diff tools in Drake and connect them with the auto diff tools pipeline in PyTorch. So I just, um, in my, I just made a cost function in PyTorch, which runs the simulation 50 times. That's my Monte Carlo samples of my initial conditions. I'm gonna choose 50 random initial conditions, run advance two, compute the, uh, take the, the gradients out of my simulation at the end and give it back to PyTorch. So that sort of integrates the two. And then I can use the PyTorch optimization um, yeah, I, I chose Adam this time, but I can use the, the suite of optimizers that um, come in PyTorch and write a very simple algorithm to, to do my, my search. So uh, let's see what it does here. So um, I, I have to say, I, I don't know if I'm just, you know, older than I was before. I used to spend a lot of time with RL, but it was, it was painful watching this thing. I mean, it, it kind of works like eventually, right? So this is, this is a 50 rollouts or whatever, um, but it took like a long time to run and you know, it's still kind of only working and, and debugging it and tuning, it's a pain in the butt. Um, so I don't find this anywhere near as satisfying as the, the you know, right of convex optimization, you know, it solves in, in a second or whatever. Um, but it, it, I, I think it does have the opportunity to work for a, a larger class of problems. So what you're seeing here is time zero to time uh, 2.5, whatever. This is, this is many rollouts, random initial conditions. I'm plotting theta. I, have, I've, I started trying to use MeshCat for plotting, but I haven't like made all the access labels and everything all work in MeshCat. But it, that way, when it's, when it's running, I can just be spewing the plots to the MeshCat, and it doesn't slow down the, the simulator. It's, on the path to being really cool, I think. Um, anyway, so the, this green line here is um, the upright configuration, which is theta equals pi. I drew it twice because it's okay if it's at pi or if it's at negative pi. Uh, right, so the, the controller is rewarded just as well for being uh, on either side. Okay, and after running for a little while, it finds some parameters that given you know initial conditions near the bottom, find its way to the top. And, uh, I mean, I can do it a bunch of different times here, right? So oh, I didn't quite converge yet. I don't know if it's gonna do better, right? It's uh, it could easily be in a local minima. It does pretty well. And uh, yeah, I mean, we can just, you can see that most of the time it does pretty well. It gets up there. I'm gonna, it's, every time I do this, it's doing random rollouts from different initial conditions. You know, it's pretty good. Sometimes it's really not very good. It's a bunch in the middle. Okay, <clears throat> but uh, that one's actually got a lot of, of failure cases. And I think one of the hard things here is it actually took a long time in the search where it, before it was spending much time uh, up at the upright. And so it really, uh, I think it has not yet converged on parameters that stabilize in some rigorous, in some way of actual convergence to the upright. It's so far happy to get here. And I'm not even sure if it'll ever converge. Um, there's, I, it feels kind of uh, stuck, but, but we'll see. That's there for you to play with uh, if, if, you, uh, if you so desire. 
Any questions about that? I had a question about uh, something we talked about a little earlier. This. Okay. So the problem we're trying to do is like minimize alpha that that gets us uh, that improves our expectation of or well. Oh, never mind. I that answer. I thought we were doing an argument of alpha. But we're doing a minimization of the expected cost. So, yes, never mind. AJ, sure. Why don't we do that? Yeah. Um, yes, I think it's directly argument of, of or it's it's 